My name is Island Parks. I live on Tanger Island. I'm a waterman. Uh, my day usually starts at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning. Right around 4, 4.30 in the morning, we start pulling pots in. The wooden bushel basket holds about, we'll say 110 to 120 crabs in a bushel. The male crab has to be 5 inches crab because that crab has a chance of shedding its shell again and becoming bigger. Now the mature female crab will not shed its shell anymore, so there's no size limit on that. I'm my own boss. Get to do what I want, when I want, come and go like a please. Nobody telling me what to do. That's something to be said for. I would say 60% of the watermen that used to be around all up and down the bay have gotten off. Tanger's going to be a ghost town in years to come. All the young people, as soon as they graduate high school, they leave. They go to college. They, uh, they get jobs off the island. They're in cycles. You go a few years where you have a great abundance of them. You go few years where it's on the decline. I mean, they're, they're really unpredictable. Back in my grandfather's day, Tangier had to leave and actually go up around uh, New York. Past two, three years, it's been excellent. There have been a lot of crabs around. But the scientists want to take the credit. We know that. But they don't listen to the watermen that do this day in and day out that spend their whole life on the water. They think we're totally idiots. They have a PhD in front of their name and think they know it all. And they don't. And we don't either. No one knows but God Almighty. He bought them here. He can take them away. My name is James Wyatt Eskridge, okay. mayor of Tangier Island. Okay. And I'm a commercial waterman. We get up early and get out to the crab shanties to get the soft crabs out of the tanks and get them packed up and ready for market, get them on their way to New York, and uh, try to be on the crabbing ground by daybreak. The underwater grasses uh, in a lot of areas have decreased, and now this area around Tangier and Smith Island is probably one of the healthiest areas for uh, underwater grasses, which is good for uh, crab populations. Juvenile crabs live in the grasses, and. Uh, but in a lot of areas in the bay, uh, the grasses have disappeared. And the watermen didn't have anything to do with the grasses disappearing. I think uh, the biggest problem on the bay is uh, pollution, water quality. Runoff from homes and businesses, uh, the large rivers that empty into the bay. I remember when I was younger, uh, you would go in these creeks and just large, large areas of forest or uh, woodlands, marshes. And now it's just homes all over the place. Uh, and these, these folks have green lawns year round, so they're probably putting a lot of fertilizer on their lawn, which eventually ends up into the bay. Our island is eroding, our island is settling. So uh, there's a combination of things that are deterring people from uh, working on the water and staying on the island. But uh, I don't know, I, li I like to think if, if God has a plan for Tangier and wants us to stay here, nothing can take us away. But then on the other hand, if he's finished with us and has other plans, nothing's going to keep us here. Tangier Island is uh, very, very religious, uh, has always been from the get-go. And uh, we depend on God for our resource, the resources and health and strength to, to go out and make a living. And uh, the Bible talks a lot about Israel. And uh, he says, who blesses the Jews, he will bless, and who curses them, he will curse. And uh, I consider mel myself a friend of Israel. I'm not, you know, I'm not against any other people group. Don't hate any other group, uh, but just uh, read a lot about Israel and the Jews in the Bible. And that's where, I, uh, that's where I got it from. God has blessed me with a good life and pretty comfortable. And if I can help other people that are struggling, uh, you know, I'm happy to do it. My name is... Tom Walters, I work for the Department of Public Works for the City of Baltimore, and I work for the Marine Operations Unit. My day starts at 7.30 in the morning, and I go out on a bass boat with either a partner or myself, and we have dip nets on the boat with a trash can and trash bags, and we go out to look for trash and try to keep our waterway clear. What I usually find in the water is mainly bottles, plastic bottles, glass bottles, potato chip bags, plastic bags, any debris that ends up on the streets of Baltimore City ends up eventually in our inner harbor. We try to go and clean the harbor up and try to keep the trash and debris going out into the bay. 
There's a lot of sludge at the bottom. And the water is real deep green color, which it's like that all the time. After a storm from the storm drains and from Jones Falls River, it turns like a brownish color. Cargo ships coming in like the Domino Sugar. They're stirring up everything from the bottom and bringing it up to the surface. And that's what's stirring up the water. Our first boom we have closest to our base here at Boston Street. That's catching the debris that comes out of the storm drain. We have one, Harris Creek, which there we have like a wind, like a house with a windmill in it. And what happens, it comes at, the trash comes out of the storm drain, goes up a conveyor and into dumpster at the end of the conveyor. We got to give a bad count at the end of the day of how much trash we've collected. And sometimes we don't even get a quarter of a bag of trash. It's so clean. They are talking to try to clean up the harbor. So it will be safe in about 10 to 15 years to be able to swim in. We are something called contract growers. Uh, we grow for Tyson. Tyson is the largest company in the United States uh, as far as meat production for poultry. Uh, they're born that morning and we end up getting them about six hours later. We provide the housing for the chicks. Uh, Tyson provides the feed. The process basically is you keep the chickens for a little over seven weeks, 51, 52, 53 days, depending on the weight, how fast they gain weight. They want them to weigh about six and a half pounds. At the end, they come in with the trucks, then they literally catch the chickens by hand. Each chicken is caught by hand, put into a crate, taken down to the plant where, where they're killed. Within 12 hours, they're in a grocery store somewhere in Baltimore or, or D.C. or Philadelphia. Region 3 is under what they consider the Chesapeake Bay Initiative, which was announced just after the election by President Obama which means the EPA is in control of the watershed, meaning the Chesapeake Bay. If the FBI wanted to come on my property, they need a warrant, a search warrant, any reason for having that search warrant, okay? Homeland Security doesn't need a reason, and the EPA doesn't need a reason. They can go out there by my chicken house, and if there's manure there, they can say, ah, oh, here's a, a potential. Doesn't have to be runoff. They don't have to go to my storm management pond and collect water samples and saying, you have high levels in my pond. About 20 to 25 percent of the pollution going into the bay was actually coming from farms at the time in the 90s. They came about with plans that would reduce that amount of, of runoff into the bay from the farms. As part of that proposal became, came the stormwater management ponds and, a, and nutrient management plans for the farmers so that the fertilizer stayed on the farms. We put in buffer strips next to the ditches. We put in spillways. We put in um, uh, a whole host of planting trees. It is definitely a cost, okay, uh, because it, it, it comes to, while we get some funding for it, we end up paying the rest of it. It's like the manure sheds that are built here. The, the federal funding or state funding pays a percentage, yet the farmer picks up the rest of the cost. And people say, well, that's a, that's a great thing. Well, you're also giving up your land. What have you done to save the bay? And I said, I spent $124,000 in the last 10 years. What have you done? And that becomes the question. Everybody, nobody disputes that it should be done, but the average person that has a house next to a stream wants to keep putting on the fertilizer for the green grass, wants to keep putting on the herbicides for, you know, the beautiful lawn and everything else, and they're polluting just as much on a smaller scale, obviously, because they only, have, they only own a, a small lot. But if you multiply that kind of pollution out here and multiply it times the number of homes, they're, they're, they're polluting 10, 15 times more than the average farmer out here. If you drive the poultry industry out of here, one in seven jobs that we have goes with the companies. Talk about an economic hit. You're talking about 15% unemployment right straight from that alone on top of what you already have with the 12%.